Hello, dear viewers. Welcome to the new series uh, called Nuggets, in which we look at um, exciting clinical cases that we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. And uh, in this particular case, our focus is on a case of um, testicular metastasis in the case of uh, Beckett's lymphoma relapse. My name is David. So Beckett's lymphoma is the most frequent subtype of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in childhood and accounts for about uh, 34 to 40% in the childhood population. Beckett's lymphoma has uh, a doubling time of approximately 24 hours, which makes it the most rapidly growing tumor known to us in, or to humanity. Um, prompt recognition and initiation of therapy are essential because um, the earlier it's diagnosed, the outcomes are very good uh, when treatment is uh, started well on time. And when we look at uh, incidences, the, it is uh, high in males than females with a mean age of about uh, eight years. So unlike other lymphomas, Beckett's lymphoma has a specific uh, geographic distribution in, which is uh, common in Central Africa, rare in places like the United States. Its prevalence in other countries may be attributed to the prevalence of AIDS in those uh, areas. Uh, according to research, there's been an association with the Epstein-Barr virus with uh, Beckett's uh, lymphoma. So usually patients would present with uh, weakness and uh, fatigue. As from the cases that were initially uh, discovered at the time when Dr. Dennis Perkett was in, in Uganda, we see that there was a large incidence of uh, cases involving the jaw and the neck, and we still see that within the lymphoma belt. And the lymphoma belt is basically this area that you are seeing here from parts of uh, West Africa, uh, east, central, and part of um, uh, southern Africa coming to the tip of um, Mozambique. So this was a region that uh, uh, Dennis Beckett actually toured on his road trip after receiving funding for his uh, uh, study. And this is now referred to as the lymphoma belt. So as we look at the case presentation, this involves a male 14 years old that um, was RVD negative, presented at a local hospital with one month history of left eye swelling, vision loss, uh, fatigue, and lymphadenopathy. An initial auxiliary node FNA was done, which we, with a possible NHL CT of the sinuses was done, and it was unremarkable. Functional endoscopic sinus surgery showed no swelling or collection. This was done in May, 2018. A biopsy was done after the FNA results. The initial admission was on the 5th of June, 2018, where a patient had um, bilateral pleural effusion on chest X-ray. A uh, patient was in no respiratory distress clinically, and there was ascites and uh, nodular hepatomegaly. Also, the patient had bilateral proptosis with vision loss, which was uh, more in the left and the right eye, and there were also signs of tumor lysis. Patient was initially put on antibiotics and started on steroids. This included dexamethasone and prednisolone. So the initial COP pre first chemotherapy was commenced on 12 June 2018 with uh, marked uh, clinical improvement within the first 48 hours, and there was also return of vision, though it was impaired. On June 18, patient was put on RHOP, which uh, involved use of methotrexate and completed the cycle on the 24th of June. As we continue with our history, the patient had a follow-up uh, CT that was done on June 20 uh, of the same year, which uh, showed um, 
only pleural effusion and the global atrophy. There were no hyla or mediastinal lymph nodes. Uh, the second cycle of chemo started on the 10th of July, which included intrathecal methotrexate. Patient was uh, arranged for ophthalmology review to establish the cause of the um, poor sight, and all that was established was just the optic atrophy. When the patient presented to the hospital for the third cycle of uh, chemo, the WBC was 4.5, HP was 10.4, with a platelet of 508. RFTs and LFTs were within normal range, but the patient did complain of headache. On the 24th of August, patient was due for fourth uh, cycle of chemo and due to severe neutropenia, the fourth cycle was withheld and rescheduled to a date after seven days. On the 1st of September 2018, patient uh, presented with the history of non-projectile vomiting, dysphagia, hoarseness of voice, and headache. Patient had no shortness of breath, and but had a non-productive cough, no night sweats, and there was no known history of TB contact. Patient had a remarkable loss of weight of two kilograms within a week. Patient had no dosuria, no hematuria, and on physical exam, he had uh, scalp lesions. During his hospital stay, he, that's when he developed um, swollen testes. And uh, during his hospital stay, the patient was basically confined to the bed, so was not uh, really uh, ambulant uh, during that stay. Other clinical examinations were unremarkable. So in view of the swelling of the test cause, he had uh, an ultrasound uh, exam requested. Uh, patient's consent was obtained. Procedure was explained. A mind ray DCN3 machine was used from Shenzhen, China. Uh, linear and endocavitary probes were used. So the um, endocavitary probe was used primarily because of the increased size of the um, uh, testicles. So in order to capture the entirety in terms of the size, in the absence of panoramic imaging, this was found to be an ideal probe. So both tests were examined in gray and uh, color Doppler. Same loops and still images were obtained. Uh, from this, uh, you can see images of the uh, uh, right test is in the uh, long axis, and then the left test is in the short uh, axis. So in the long axis, the test was about uh, 5.6, and the uh, left was about uh, 6 centimeters uh, more than the field of view that you'd obtain on uh, a linear probe. So this image shows... Um, uh, the right and the left testis in transverse section with color Doppler on, and you can see that there is a marked uh, uh, vascularity within the testicular parenchyma. On this image, we can appreciate that there are actually hypodense, ill-defined lesions that are diffusely spread uh, within the testicular parenchyma, and we see no fluid collection around it. So the significant ultrasound findings that uh, we obtained is that the parenchyma was uh, heterogeneous, as Ailey explained and shown, with EU-defined hypoechoic masses. There was hyperemia of the parenchyma on color Doppler. There was no evidence of epididymal involvement or hydrosome. Bilaterally, the pampinform plexus was within normal limits. The left test is volume was 25 cubic, whilst that of the right was 29 cubic. And these findings are similar to what was found by Kwon and others in a study done in 2019 in a case of uh, metastatic spread to the test in, in a case of um, Burkitt's lymphoma. So the patient had a CT done and during the CT examination, this was a, um, a, a follow-up CT involved the head, neck, uh, chest and abdomen, but unfortunately the uh, scrotum was within the field of view though not intended and um, 
when I had a look to measure the Hansfield units in the areas where there were those hypoechoic lesions, those evidence of avid contrast uptake from 44 um, Hansfield units to about uh, 73. So the other investigations that were performed, which uh, uh, for the purposes of appreciation was just a CT that showed enhancing scalp lesions. Uh, I do not have the images for the CT. The abdomen was clear as well as the chest. Patient also was uh, uh, booked for an osophagoscopy, which was negative, although it, the scope could not go beyond the OGJ. On FNA, the cranial lesions showed uh, malignant cells in keeping with uh, uh, Beckett's lymphoma relapse. Uh, the prognosis was indeed quite poor at this junction. The patient was, uh, the family of the patient was cancelled by the oncology team. The two are the FNA reports. Uh, uh, the one on the left uh, is indicative of non Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma of high grade. And then the bone biopsy that was done showed, did confirm that it was uh, a case of uh, Beckett's uh, lymphoma, as you, can, as you can see from the report on the right. So in terms of the reflective report and in terms of our practice, uh, when we use imaging, particularly ultrasound, mostly the low resource uh, setup, we also need to be mindful of these features, especially when we're dealing with um, uh, the young population and children and young adults, when we find uh, certain masses, which may not be uh, primary lesions, but rather if we are dealing with a case of um, a non-malignant such as Beckett's lymphoma and would find these uh, features, it should raise a concern that we may be dealing with a case of uh, relapse. And uh, since uh, orchiectomy is one of the options, in a case where the disease is not that advanced, it may be considered as uh, one of the options. So we find that in the endemic variant, uh, the head and the neck are commonly involved, whilst in the sporadic form, it mostly involves the abdomen as seen from the study done by Shad and McGrath in 1997. Um, we may also have other systemic features that uh, present with uh, disseminated disease, but the case of uh, testicular involvement has been not uh, documented in about 5% of the male patients. Uh, this uh, was confirmed in a study done by Biko and others in 2009. So in terms of management, the patient was basically put on palliative care due to poor prognosis and uh, on discharge patient had persistent uh, jaw pain and uh, orchiectomy was not an option in this case. So patient was put on Cotrimoxazole, morphine, folic acid, methotrexate, and rescheduled for a review after a month. But unfortunately, the patient um, passed on after two weeks, uh, which was indeed uh, sad. So there was, uh, there was never any follow-up in terms of the case. So that is the end of my case presentation. These are my references and the images uh, um, mine and uh, yes. So uh, that's the end of the presentation. I hope uh, you will come back uh, here to listen in to another exciting nugget. And I hope this is your first nugget on this series. Thank you. And um, as I end this presentation, let me say in the words of Pliny in 23 to say 9c, he says, ex Africa sempe aliquid noi, which means Africa always brings something new. On your right is an image of a plant called uh, Euphorbia tirucali, which uh, is quite common in within this region of the so-called lymphoma belt. You find that parts of Southern Africa use this plant for as a 
fence as a fencing for some homesteads or cattle crow and the like. And some people use it and have a belief that it can actually treat uh, certain diseases. But unfortunately, according to research, it appears to be a, a, a cancer promoter. And I do hope that in the years to come, I'll consider a, a study to look into its um, association with prevalence of uh, B cell lymphomas in this particular region. Thank you once again.